Is this working? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Sharada Srinivasan. I am a research fellow uh, at the Center for Technology, Innovation, and Competition at the University of Pennsylvania's Law School. Uh, I am here moderating the session on overcoming barriers to investment in connectivity. Uh, this is a 60-minute session uh, that tends to explore various barriers to financing connectivity, in particular to underserved communities. And the idea behind the session is to try and both understand these barriers in a more nuanced way, but also try and understand policy environments that enable such, finan like such investments, financial investments in particular, in last mile connectivity. We have a great panel to get us started, and we are hoping that this is an interactive session. Uh, so I will introduce the panelists at first, and then we will like then give you an overview of the structure of the session, followed by some discussion that we will have. So I will first give you broad remarks from our research on financing connectivity and what we have learned from studying over 120 projects in 50 countries in the last three years as part of One World Connected. Following that, we will have fire starter remarks from three of our panelists. We are still waiting for one panelist, Paul Rowney, but up until now, we will have Antonio Garcia, who is uh, joining us from the Inter-American Development Bank, um, uh, the headquarters in DC, and uh, he will be providing his comments uh, via remote. Um, then we have uh, Alan Bailochan Tuladhar, who is the head of PicoSoft Nepal, uh, which is a, like a network that is using TV white space technology in Nepal. Um, then we have Wi Fi Interactive Network Philippines, Philip Zululeta, which is a tech startup in the Philippines that's trying to use ad supported uh, business models to try and spread connectivity to underserved communities. And we have from Namibia, Paul Rowney, who has just joined us, uh, who will provide us an African perspective uh, to the questions that we are interested in, in terms of uh, where the investments are coming from, what the landscape is like, what are the barriers that exist, and what, where do we go from here. For those coming into the room, come forward. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, and thank you for joining us in this afternoon session. So I will briefly start, uh, because I, I really think the wealth of knowledge is in our panel here, uh, who are doing the like hard work both of deploying on the ground as well as raising money to sustain such deployments. Uh, at One World Connected, we study initiatives that connect underserved communities. We do that both through supply-side projects that try to use innovative technologies to try and connect underserved communities at all sorts of scale. So we have mostly rural, remote, local projects, but we also study regionally, regionally vast deployments and sometimes national deployments as well. Uh, from our research, we realized that financing connectivity seems to have a very checkered landscape. There seems to be a vast variety of players and not a lo lot of clarity on where exactly the funds are and to what exactly they are going into. So on one hand, we have the development finance and the development aid community, which through our research at least has showed, has been investing primarily in large network scale deployments in say fiber um, or like backbone infrastructure. And then we have like companies like Microsoft, for instance, that's like started grant initiatives that are trying to fund startups, which are trying to have sustainable business models to do the same, uh, to, to fund connectivity as well. Then after that, we also have a huge host of civil society organizations that have their own grant awards. We had the Seed Alliance Awards earlier this afternoon. ISIF, Frida, and FIRE, along with ISOC, all have their own net, Beyond the Nets grants program, which are much sm smaller in scale and still try to fund connectivity. But the scale and the kinds of projects that are like that reach out to these uh, funders are widely variant, and it really remains to be seen what kind of funding models sustain over the long term. If you want to create a sustainable investment in last mile connectivity, if you want to create something that lasts, what are the ways in which we fund this, and how do we ensure that it lasts? Those are the questions that we are really interested in asking, and we have like a diversity both in region as well as in expertise. Uh, 
to, to answer those questions. But without further ado, I will start by uh, requesting uh, Antonio Garcia Zabellos, who is with the Inter-American Development Bank with the telecommunications uh, sector with a wide regional expertise on in infrastructure investments, especially in the Latin America and Caribbean region. And Antonio, if you can hear us, could you please provide remarks? <laughs> Yeah, hello, thank you very much for having me here and for the opportunity of addressing some few words um, and also for the organization of, those, of this interesting panel. Um, you know, uh, when, when we're thinking about this problem associated to financing and infrastructure, I would like to, uh, uh, to stress that there are four major aspects that we need to keep in mind, and that, uh, particularly those are uh, uh, aspects that we have uh, observed in the case of uh, Latin American and the Caribbean countries. The first one has to do with the socio-demographic approach. So most of the time we are talking very much about uh, what is the situation uh, national-wide, but the true thing is that we realize that the magnitude of the problem differs pretty much whether we are considering uh, rural versus uh, urban areas. So uh, the first thing that we hit, that we have to keep in mind when we are thinking about a financial strategy is which are precisely the area that we are intending to cover and what are precisely the type of uh, public services that we are thinking of. Uh, and these are an important uh, aspect to keep in mind. For instance, uh, uh, there are many, many countries in Latin America where the penetration rate of 4G and 3G are still below uh, 50% or 30%. So, whereas the, the 2G penetration are above uh, uh, 90% in, in most of the cases. So, let's say that there will be a natural way for countries to, by, by means of upgrading the, the digital infrastructure, like, like for instance the mobile infrastructure, to start providing, uh, uh, you know, broadband services across the different uh, areas of the country uh, at a minimum, uh, let's say, cost. Um, in any case, there, there will be a, a decision on, on how to bring public and, and private into, into that particular grading. So the first thing that, I, that we have to keep in mind is precisely this socio-demographic approach that I was saying between rural and urban. And second, how we can take advantage of the existing infrastructure like the 2G and how to upgrade them, or even how to uh, make use of the uh, electricity power line just to uh, reach out those areas which are, at this moment in time are not connected or, uh, you know, the quality of the service is not that good. The second aspect is that we have to come up with uh, particular financial financial uh, models that uh, makes the business case for telecom operators really work on those particular areas. So uh, we have been talking very much about public-private partnerships, uh, but you know uh, w the the question that that we need to to think of is whether this PPP model is different depending on the type of the infrastructure that we are financing. Uh, I mean, uh, is it the same model of PPP when we are thinking about a submarine cable uh, or, a, a, or, a or the deployment of, a, of, um, of an optical fiber network or even a data center or even a satellite? Because, you know, all of them in, in one way or another are going to contribute to the, to the you know, to bridge the existing gap, but also uh, could contribute to uh, strengthening uh, the demand and, and foster innovation. So the, the, PPP, the PPP model probably has to be adjusted to the particularities of the, of the country and the particularity of the network that we are trying to finance. And uh, for instance, in this particular regard, we are, uh, uh, the bank is uh, at this moment in time uh, thinking about alternative models, like for instance, issuing uh, digital bonds, taking into account that governments are seated on uh, particular, um, uh, you know, public assets, like uh, for instance, uh, universal service funds that are not being used, like, for instance, uh, uh, spectrum uh, frequency blocks that has not been allocated. And it could be a way for the government to issue digital bonds, the same way as they are issuing uh, treasury bonds, uh, that are somehow linked to particular um, projects related to digital infrastructure as a key uh, uh, acts uh, included in the uh, digital agenda. The third aspect uh, is related to regulatory framework. For instance, if we just go to Latin America and the Caribbean region, we realize that most of the, of the countries are having regulatory framework which dates from, uh, you know, late 1990s or early 2000s. So in most of the cases, the, the world broadband as we understand today is not captured 
and th that is why uh, you know developing a specific or modern uh, regulatory framework such as uh, infrastructure sharing, such as um, uh, you know rights of ways, could be something important to keep in mind just to facilitate the deployment and to make that deployment easier. Uh, so, for instance, another important topic to keep in mind is the uh, issue related to the local depo deployment and how local authorities sometimes are uh, introducing complications in such a deployment. So, and then the, the last one, which is not uh, which is not minor thing, is the institutionality. So, we sometimes realize that uh, the countries are not having uh, and specific institutions dealing with the uh, digital infrastructure, and they are relying pretty much on the private sector as the key players to bring connectivity in those areas which at this moment in time are not connected, or to bring connectivity at a particular quality even in those areas which at this moment in time are, co are connected. So there is also a challenge from that particular uh, aspect, and it is not just that we need to bring the Ministry of Telecommunications from the countries. Probably we have to think of alternative uh, players like uh, president offices, like, uh, for instance, the Minister of Finance, uh, because eventually they will also have uh, a war on, on this particular uh, on this particular matter. So uh, let's say that by by having actions on on those particular aspects, let's say the socio demographic uh, and the upgrading of the infrastructure, the alternative financial models, the update of the regulatory framework, and the uh, institutionality are going to uh, make the country be prepared uh, for a better connectivity and moreover. Uh, to make use of the of the connectivity as a trigger for competitiveness, for uh, digital, I mean, uh, and for reducing the digital divide across the different sectors of the economy or even the, the social the social gap. So thank you very much, and I am open for questions. Uh, I suppose at the end of the of the session. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Antonio, for those remarks. After we have the fire starter remarks from all of our panelists, we will have an open discussion from different stakeholder group like perspectives. Uh, we intended to do it like a bit of a breakout group format, but given the structure of this room, I don't think the breakout group panel format really works out. So we will just have a Q&A session instead uh, with the panelists, all of whom have like very different skill sets and very unique and regional spe regionally specific perspectives on this matter. Um, I now move to uh, the first person on my, uh, on my left, um, Alan Bailochan Tuladar. He is uh, the Microsoft Regional Director in Nepal and also has a network called Picosoft Nepal that deploys T white spaces technology in rural villages in Nepal. They were an airband grantee last year and some of the work that they are doing is, am I audible? Yeah, some of the work that they are doing is, is okay. Uh, some of the work that, that is being done is incredibly fascinating. So I will hand over the mic to him. Thank you. Um, I think maybe I should step back a bit to talk about why internet is so important in uh, rural Nepal, uh, where we take it for granted while sitting in a conference like this that internet is uh, working and and de facto that uh, that everyone has access to it. Uh, but still, statistics we all know half the world's population, and in a country like Nepal, where uh, the geographic terrain is extremely difficult. Uh, impossible to lay fiber across to homes so that they have uh, access to affordable, I think the key is affordable, accessible because uh, majority of the people are still below the poverty line to make it affordable for them. But we kind of ask saying, why do they need internet? Most of the families, uh, historically, I think if you look at Nepal, we've um, fought World War I for other people's wars. We've fought World War II and majority of Nepalese have always been um, uh, working for other countries, whether that's the uh, uh, providing security to, to the Queen of England or to the police of uh, Singapore or Brunei or uh, Indian Army or British Army. or So we've, we've had this history of having Nepalese um, uh, overseas. Um, most of the people that's, that's the diaspora who is working overseas spend about one third of their money uh, calling back home in an international call. Uh, had they had the digital skills and the connectivity, their calls could really have dropped. 
not only uh, doing voice calls, they could have been doing uh, video calls and finding out, did the children go to school, what was cooked, did the money that I sent home, did it arrive, and, and whatever. They're kind of homesick, called 10 times a day, and, and with, with that, that being a killer app, uh, I think the connectivity is so much more important. Along with that brings commerce, along with that brings a whole lot of other uh, related aspects. Um, a couple of areas that we looked at saying, if, given the fact that internet is needed, and given the fact that there is a need for, even where basic voice on uh, uh, mobile phones are not uh, available, uh, connectivity is a big challenge. We looked at different technologies, and uh, white space technology was, was something that we wanted to test out. And um, over this year's monsoon, uh, monsoon we have incessant rains for literally weeks long, and one of the worst monsoons in about 35 years was this year. Um, I think our biggest problem with the network this year was more on the power, having not seen the sun and using solar power, rather than the, the connectivity of uh, uh, point to multipoint with white space technology going through different hills and mountains and trees and other foliages and uh, providing high speed broadband connectivity to the households. How do we finance this? I think the big question is, um, we, I think it's, it's a mix between um, pure capitalism where we look at venture capital, 10x profits, to pure socialism where we say this is, has to be done for social good and has to be invested upon for the good of, uh, so that would be mainly, I think, the government uh, looking at the universal service fund to see how do we fund this. We're kind of in between to see how do we use this social capital, provide the impact that's required, uh, might not get the uh, benefits in terms of the investments. We uh, were able to attract uh, the development aid finance as well that Shahida was talking earlier, to be able to get the uh, British government to literally do uh, uh, a test on a new technology like white space to find out if it works. And if it does, can it be uh, scaled up and deployed in other countries? Uh, Microsoft as a, as a company was, uh, uh, we were able to get a, uh, support from the Airband Initiative to deploy the technology. And then the next big thing is how do we scale this up to a extensive uh, level? White space, I think, in general, is still um, very capital intensive. Uh, it's still not uh, to the extent that mass uh, deployment has not been done across the world and manufacturing is still limited, making the cost of uh, equipment fairly expensive versus other point to multipoint line of sight radio equipment, which is literally uh, much more cheaper than, than white space technology. And I think the big challenge is, uh, is how do we make this investment sustainable? The one-time grants are easy to get, but because this is so capital intensive, how do we scale this up so that uh, even with a, a much smaller network, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in rural areas who never had seen internet get that wow moment for the first time when they use the internet, whether that is to look at my um, Normal example that I uh, provide is uh, showing what a, vol a volcano looks like. When they see it, they get it in a minute. When they st uh, go on to science classes and they're explained about a volcano, it just doesn't, they just don't get it. I mean, things like when audiovisual live streaming from the internet is provided. Uh, in the past week, we've also looked at uh, digital video uh, broadcast to use one stream in terms of saving our uh, OPEX um, internet that would have been available for a couple of dollars in the U.S. for us is over um, at least 15 times more expensive uh, than, uh, so the backhaul internet is still extremely expensive for us. So that, that kind of adds on to make it sustainable in the long run. So, so making sure that we provide not only accessible, but also high quality, high speed broadband internet becomes a challenge. And then the next challenge that we're looking at is saying, once we put this TV white space and have the backhaul internet onto a school, onto the local government office, the big challenge was how do we make sure that people are able to consume this? So last, not only the mile, but also the last meter was, was important. The last meter being content, the last meter being language, the last meter being accessibility, and the last meter also being digital literacy. 
And in terms of financing, it's not only financing the equipment, also financing the soft skills that's required so that the consumption of the internet and the values that the internet brings is also able to be, to be provided. And I think we're in the midst of saying that financing in, in especially countries like Nepal has to be with a, with a uh, social mind onto it. So it's got to be more of a social capital rather than purely a venture capital or purely profit-oriented capital. Thank you. I think I'll take the rest in, in the QA session. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your remarks. That was incredibly rich in terms of the realities of cha and challenges that exist in rural Nepal. And we are very grateful for the real world perspectives and experiences from the grassroots that we are able to bring to this session. Because really, what really enriches this discussion beyond the policy is the experiences of the people doing the deployments. And with that, I think we will move to the next one uh, from Philippines, Wi-Fi Interactive Network. They have a very different business model, and they will talk to us about the challenges and uh, opportunities that they see in financing that. Thank you, Sharada. So um, the topic of this uh, session, I guess, is overcoming barriers to investment. And we're also a recipient of the Microsoft Airban uh, Initiative. We uh, received a grant on their very first batch. Um, so when we talk about investment, we're really talking about a return on investment, if that's correct, right? So the idea is we have to follow the money. So if an investor talks to us and says, okay, if we were to invest in connectivity, uh, it's a very challenging topic because on the one hand, you have a very high cost of providing service. So as Alan mentioned, you have the cost of equipment. And not only that, you have the cost of training, the cost of installation, not to mention the operational cost of uh, paying for bandwidth. So that's one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation, you have the audience or the user base that don't have much spending capacity. So you have high cost of providing service to a group of people that really can't afford to pay much for that service. So it's really a dilemma. So if you're an investor, looking at this space, and we've talked to many, many venture capitalists, the real question for them is, is this a 10x investment opportunity for them? And how will they re recover the, the investment that they provide if they were to bet on this space? So it's a real challenge. So in the Philippines, there's no question that the consumers or the users are hungry for internet uh, connections. It, it, it's, we don't even have to explain what the benefits are. It's obvious to them, right? So the question is, if I have very limited capacity, where is that revenue going to come from? How is this investment going to pay for itself if I'm going to put money into this space? So the way we approach this problem and this question is not so much to generate revenue from the users themselves. In fact, we're actually focused on uh, providing free Wi-Fi to the user base that we're addressing. Now, free Wi-Fi is not free for us. It costs a lot of money. So the way we're tackling this issue is we're developing partnerships specifically with private enterprises, companies that have a stake in selling their products and services that are dependent on internet connectivity to reach their consumers. So for instance, if we can set up our Wi-Fi hotspots in high traffic public areas where a lot of people congregate, then we can offer them free Wi-Fi and offer them a marketplace to avail of services that sponsor that connectivity. So if those sponsors can generate business and revenue by providing their basic services to consumers anyway, then it's a win-win for everybody. So we've had the opportunity to try at least three business models so far in the three years that I founded this company. And each one was a great idea to begin with, but as soon as you roll out all of these um, business models, this is where you uh, encounter all of the challenges. I'll give you an example. So one of the very first models that we executed was what we call sponsored Wi-Fi, 
we uh, talked to a big, a giant consumer goods company to pay for the cost of providing Wi-Fi at community uh, stores. So these are mom and pop stores. So the idea was if you purchase one of our branded products, for instance, you buy a packet of shampoo, you in exchange, you receive 30 minutes of free internet access. So conceptually, it makes sense, right? The consumer doesn't have to shell out additional money just to get internet access because they have to purchase shampoo or soap or whatever product from that store anyways. The problem we encountered when we actually rolled out this, this idea was that the stores don't have POS systems to track and attribute the sale for the free Wi-Fi reward. So then, you know, we couldn't sustain the, uh, the corporate sponsor's investment in this type of approach because they couldn't attribute the, the sale of their products to the, the reward. So we moved on to several other uh, business models. One was a paid version, and one now is a marketplace version. I'd be happy to discuss this uh, specific models with you. But at the end of the day, I think when we're talking about investment in connectivity, uh, it's obvious that you know it's it's it, it has to produce a return on investment to the to the funder. And so the question is, is this really a venture capital type of funding activity, or is it developmental in nature, given the fact that we're trying to address an audience that has limited spending capacity? And as far as regulatory uh, policies are concerned, I think in, in the Philippines, we've been trying to lobby the government to uh, allow us to actually serve the public through government facilities where people are waiting and we can provide free Wi-Fi too. And so that's in the works right now. Um, for TV white space, for instance, we also tried to use that in the Philippines, but the lobby against using it by the broadcast networks was just too much for us to overcome. So these are the things that we need help on, and I think an awareness of these problems would be very helpful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Philip. And uh, I would, uh, wanted to explain that uh, Sharda has to, had to leave because she needs to return to the United States. And I just came from another session, so I'm happy to take over in her stead. Uh, and uh, happy to acknowledge now, thank you for your remarks, Philip, and acknowledge Paul to talk, give uh, uh, his perspective on what we are very proud is a very regionally diverse panel spanning all the different areas. And now Paul has done yeoman's work in Africa helping connect communities there. Paul. Thank you. Very smooth changeover of chair there. <laughs> uh, my, my name is Paul Rowney. Uh, I uh, live and work in Africa. Uh, I love TV white space. That's my day job <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm not involved in uh, talking like this. Uh, when we look at uh, rolling out uh, last mile connectivity projects, uh, there, there's a lot of challenges. And it's not really a technology challenge. These we can overcome. It's not really a price of equipment. Uh, this is uh, changing. And we're getting down to price points that uh, are, are much more affordable. Uh, the, the challenge is uh, convincing the funders, the people with the money, that uh, you've got a bankable business plan. And it's difficult. Uh, when you're looking at uh, last mile networks, uh, you've got a consumer that uh, really doesn't have much to spend. So when you build that business model, you've got to take your OPEX, CAPEX, uh, you getting into remote areas that are more expensive than other areas to reach. Uh, there is a reason why uh, our mobile operators are not operating there, and that's because it doesn't fit their models. So the models that we operate on are different. Uh, we've got different matrices. But if you go to traditional uh, funders, you know they, they want the traditional stuff. Uh, you know, how much money you're going to make, where you're going to make it from, how much you're going to sell the service for, how much can the people pay, afford to pay, how many people you're going to have, subscribers. Then then we have the complexity of, of uh, the regulations. Often the regulations don't support uh, uh, technologies uh, such as TV white space and other new technologies. So without that uh, piece of paper, uh, often you, you just can't start. Uh, I've been engaged with uh, Microsoft and Facebook, and uh, I'm engaged with quite a lot of our partners across the continent of Africa. And we work with them. Uh, part of the service we do is to help them business model. And we, we, we are coming to that holy grail of, of uh, finding uh, a model where you can deliver a service as close to free as possible. Uh, the cross subsidies, like uh, our colleagues are talking about, are often quite important to enable us to achieve that. 
it, 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 you don't necessarily have to charge for the service or you can find ways to cross-subsidize that service. What, what we're, we're starting to look at in, in our part of the world is at the rural level is, is to have uh, hubs, community hubs, and the community hub, the core of it is providing connectivity services, but uh, the other services that they start to provide are things like financial uh, services. And this is where uh, we can start to derive revenue. So by offering uh, e-money uh, as an agency, uh, which then enables uh, that centre to start uh, uh, facilitating government services, uh, because now we've got a fixed point where people can apply for their passport, pay for their passport, and, th and there's fees and revenue that can flow in, in, into the model. Uh, we're also looking at uh, running these uh, community hubs. Uh, you know, they become the post office in the community, so now we've got a fixed uh, presence for people to collect their post, which means they can start engaging in e-commerce, because now we've got uh, financial services, someone can go in, there's internet, and then, uh, of course, uh, power, you know, solar power, these centers. So often uh, the, where the rural connectivity is might be the only place in, in the village that actually has uh, electricity, and it becomes a center where people can actually go, communicate, collaborate, share information. It, it's like what in Africa would have been the tree. You know, the, the village would have congregated under the tree. Now we're looking to them to congregate around the, the, this technology center, which is the hub of uh, providing uh, digital services into that community. So you take that to a traditional uh, finance institution and you know it's a little bit too complex for them because <laughs> you're relying on multiple uh, uh, revenue streams. So y y we need to start either educating, get them to understand or look at alternate financing. And there are uh, alternate financing uh, institutions now that, that do understand uh, this need. Uh, there's uh, a gentleman uh, that many of us might know with uh, Frank McCusker, but he used to be with the uh, For Africa Initiative in Kenya and uh, he is now with a institution which I've written down here, but uh, Good Networks. But uh, they're, they're, they're one of many that now understand that uh, you know, there are financial, there are business models that uh, can be understood that can drive the good and uh, are sustainable. But it's, it's understanding the complexities of the problem. We, we, it, it, the, it's often uh, easier to get funding for a big network. So if, if you're doing a national rollout, then you know, and you want billions of dollars. <laughs> it's often easier to raise money for that than it is to raise money for a village network, where you're looking at uh, smaller amounts, which could be ten thousand US or hundred thousand US. So often, raising small money, which is what the community networks need, is harder than raising uh, large amounts of money, which funders seem to be more comfortable. Including, if if, if in Namibia, for example, we, we we actually at one point we were looking at funding uh, to connect most of the schools and clinics, and we had uh, quite a lot of funding interest. Uh, we didn't get the regulatory approval, so without that piece of paper, you know, that project was, was uh, temporarily put on hold. Well, thank you very much, Paul. It is uh, and fascinating, one of the themes that you state is there is a mismatch between large finance in terms of scale. Um, they often uh, large financial, traditional financing instruments do not know or understand how to deal with projects as small as community level interventions. And there has been a lot of effort to try to un tap uh, into those markets to try to make them available. But I would say at this point, those are more uh, preliminary and speculative than real at this point. So it is a real challenge that we all face. So at this point, if I'm correct, everyone has had their initial statements, including uh, Antonio from the Inter-American Development Bank. So this is the stage where uh, we are trying to draw on the knowledge in the room. Uh, one of the things about this proposal that we uh, actually scored the highest of all the proposals in, all in the IGF process is because what we suggested is that there is so much additional knowledge in not just represented here, but among the different participants in the room that we wanted to have an open discussion now about ways to overcome the kinds of challenges that the panelists have identified and also other challenges you may have uh, identified on your own. So at this point, I would like to open up to the floor and get your feedback on these ideas, but I will ask you to identify yourself and because we do have remote participation, make sure to speak into a microphone if you would. And please in the back. Does this work? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, I think there's a basic issue, I've been working on this for half a century, that we're modeling this on selling services as if it's telecom and more to the point of railroad. And what we're trying, the problem we have is we need the business model of roads, not the business model of services. That this should be basic infrastructure. So how do you get investment in roads? You know, people did try to have a profit, you know, center model that, you know, century ago, and that didn't work. So the real question is how do we encourage investment in physical infrastructure, which means to get communities to buy in, but more important, to separate what we do with the network. So I can understand you want to connect a school. That's a useful project using whatever means. But the long term is providing the basic infrastructure for all purposes. And the difficulty in selling that is probably similar to the problem of explaining why you need roads in the early 1900s. But there is a business model for roads, but the value goes to the community as a whole, and the profit comes to the community. And that is a business model, but we need people to understand that. If we try to sell services, the simple example I use, we try to sell service like phone calls. That's an app in here. It's not a service you buy anymore. I think that's true for a lot of these services. And any attempt to be able to charge for usage requires preventing connectivity because you then put a paywall back. So an example I use is at one point in Serengeti, cellular phones are used to track lions. But each lion needed an account. The cows couldn't get an account. They weren't worth that much. If the community owned the radio as infrastructure, it then becomes available. So the question is, how do we adopt an infrastructure model and get people to understand that is a business model? Uh, oh, there we are. So it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, are, is the internet the new road infrastructure? Um, I do have one reaction, which was um, think about the old telephone network, which were typically publicly owned and publicly run once upon a time. Uh, there's been a change, and I do remember that um, there's an, I um, did some studies to try to understand where that type of investment works and where it doesn't. The challenge has been that um, there's operating expenses in the network, and, and more so than the telephone network. The telephone network, you could take a, a phone from the 1920s, attach it to the wall, it would still work. In this space, we are reinvesting in new technologies, reconfiguring them, security patches, and the like. And there's an interesting question about whether the same sort of approaches we use in roads will work as effectively in a, a, something like the internet. Okay. Uh, I can go with a lot of detail, but I make it very briefly. The phone model, remember, they charged for usage, and it never really worked. This is why the United States who created the Federal Communications Commission in order to have regulations, because the model, as with the railroads, of high capital costs, low differentiation, never really worked. The internet actually is a viable model by separating the infrastructure from the services. So the transition from phones to creating apps is a good example. So we don't want to go too much in the phone thing, but remember the phone system was very expensive too, high cost and everything, because the technology did change. And you know, yes, we maintain compatibility in the software, I could take devices, but so again, I can go into more detail, I just want to warn you about the danger of, of analogies. So just to also add on what was mentioned, uh, W w one of the key challenges that uh, last mile operators face or community networks is that middle mile. And in Africa, we don't have that middle mile. So it, it does need to be part of the core infrastructure. It should be budgeted by government. And you've got the whole build once approach where, you know, we're, we're very good at building roads and now we're starting to become good at building railways again in Africa. But we still don't run fiber down those roads and we still don't run fiber down the bridges and, and, and railways. And it, ne it needs to be a forethought, not an afterthought. But we don't do that yet, and it, it's got to be part of government planning. I, I, I agree with the middle mile. Just one quick comment. Uh, I often use the example that, you know, about Wikimedia where you can bring a disk in. So you get some of the value. You can have a server in a village that delivers value. And they argue that we do need fiber for that, but how do you feed the donkeys you use to transport the disks? We feed them fiber. Okay, sorry. If, if nobody laughed, I missed on that one. Yeah, I'm a bit surprised that the whole discussion is like having whether we have the internet or we don't, whether we should pay for it or we should not. 
Um, there's actually a very good business model that's been proven to work very well. It's drugs. You get the, f you get the first one for free, and then you need to pay if you want more. Uh, by the way, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Stefan from Kiwix. Um, there's on the internet, there's the one you need to actually be connected, which is mostly social, and then there's a lot of static content. And this one, you don't need to update it all the time. So you can get a solution where static content doesn't cost that much in terms of data, and that one is free. And then people know what they could have if they have the internet, and then they'd be more enticed to pay for that kind of content. Um, we do work with people, actually, in, around Cape Town. We have a sort of project like this where they have a mesh network in a township and then you can get your Wikipedia or whatever static content you want for free and if you want to check your email or go social then you pay for it. And I wanted to ask Alan and the gentleman, I'm sorry I forgot your name from the Philippines, um, if you'd explored Philip from the Philippines, how could I forget? Shame on me. Um, I wanted to know if you'd explored such a, so such a solution where it's actually a mix of free static content and then pay for um, more dynamic content? Um, actually, we've just deployed. Um, uh, so we kind of partnered with the British Army where they have been using uh, similar uh, using in terms of technology, digital video broadcast, one-way internet using a satellite small home dish uh, that would get the uh, link down. So static content like training uh, materials, uh, live videos as television content where you would not have to literally send a URL even up and it would just be uh, getting it streamed down without even having, uh, uh, we wanted to go as much cloud as possible without having and go serverless as much as possible. So uh, lower the uh, power consumption as much as possible on our uh, NOx. Uh, and yes, we've been uh, looking at uh, using DVB to stream uh, regular, uh, mostly demanded YouTube videos, uh, local television content, um, uh, and also a lot of um, training materials and uh, uh, Wikipedia and a few other uh, content, uh, newspapers, uh, more static content. Well, static in the way that it's static for a day or so, for a month or so, for um, uh, movies and uh, things like that that would get uh, streamed one way. So uh, that, I think, has uh, worked well because uh, our backhaul internet is not being used and we are using uh, digital video streaming uh, to come down uh, with the content uh, over a small uh, home dish uh, uh, antenna and, and providing it over our uh, network of uh, white space technology and then the um, uh, access points going onto the Wi-Fi, onto their devices and giving them as much richer content as possible without having to uh, spend on the back end. I hope that answers your question. So to answer your question directly, no, we haven't looked into drugs yet, but we're tempted. <laughs> um, I think one of the business models that are actually so obvious that's, that's worked so far um, are the business models of Facebook and Google, right? It's free to the, the content is free to the user. Uh, user doesn't pay. But the thing is, in order for that model to work, you have to uh, generate so much venture funding to keep the, the party going until at some point you reach a level of scale that you can justify the investment and you can now monetize that, uh, the traffic that goes through your network. So I think if we're talking about commuting networks, I think that's the real challenge is if you're talking about smaller packets of, of internet access, it's very difficult for advertisers to bite into that and, and, and invest money into it because the scale of reach uh, in terms of their audience is not as big as, say, the reach of a Facebook or a Google can, can generate, right? So at the end of the day, uh, it begs the question now is, you know, do you want to keep investing in something to generate scale first and then monetize later? like a typical venture capital funding? Or are there other business models that uh, we, can, we can creatively look at? And I think Paul mentioned something about digital services earlier. And this is exactly the direction we're taking with our version 3.0 of our business model. So 
uh, the bottom line is we're gonna give connectivity for free. So like what the gentleman mentioned earlier, we're not gonna charge for the cost of infrastructure for people to avail of services. That's a given, okay, like roads, for instance. But the companies that benefit when that road is there have a commercial um, stake in terms of getting something in return. So if we develop those partnerships, if we nurture those partnerships, so we can give these companies an audience to market their products and services, then there's a business model out there. So one obvious um, transaction is, for instance, online remittance. So in the Philippines, it's a $25 billion uh, industry of international funds coming into the Philippines from uh, Filipino workers working overseas, right? But the domestic market is as big, if not bigger as well. So if we can um, allow consumers to trans transfer funds using our Wi-Fi hotspots and earn transactional fees by moving funds from one hotspot to another city or town, then there's a business model there that we can take advantage of. This is Edmund Chung from, from Data Asia. Um, this, this is a topic that definitely is a quite um, near and dear to my heart. And the question is, uh, why haven't we solved <laughs> any of this? Um, uh, it's, it, listening and hearing the, the challenges is, is kind of interesting. One, one, one thing that comes to mind is why, why isn't this a priority yet for, for governments as they pave the road, as they, you know, why aren't, why isn't it put there? Is there, uh, for for this group or, or people around here, is it a a, a policy you know uh, thing that that we should need to push for? Uh, is this something that that needs to be part of let's say the the SDGs and you know governments are racing you know chasing down those KPIs? We got to put that uh, as part of it so that it's measured and therefore when they build new roads that that, that you know is is that the 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 the, the answer? And then. Uh, I want to share a couple of, I, I guess, experience from, from Hong Kong, where, where we come from. Of course, Hong Kong is highly connected and, and stuff, but, but of, there are also uh, rural areas and, and challenges. What is interesting is, first of all, um, if there is basic connectivity, um, so maybe the question is not necessarily building alternative networks or alternative uh, infrastructure to serve that, but uh, again, going back to regulations or or regulatory f framework to, to you know, require the incumbent or require the existing network to open up. Maybe it's a cost issue. The cost issue is because not in, not they're charging high prices for individuals there. Um, you know, what, what happened in, for example, in Hong Kong was in the early days, it was, it was kind of forced open in some sense that you have to offer this, uh, this network to internet service providers at a you know, particular rate at which, is, which is low. Um, that that is one first phase of it, the and that kind of creates a bit better business without requirement of uh, intensive capex, right? Uh, for for smaller providers to 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 specifically address certain uh, areas of uh, uh, geographically or, or, or community-wise. In a second phase, what what happened in Hong Kong, which I think is also interesting, is um, a, an initiative that started just a few years ago. Uh, looked at uh, the underprivileged uh, 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 living within the urban area. Uh, and by looking at that and, and, and doing a bunch of study, we realized that it's the billing services and customer support that is costing the most for these telcos. Uh, ISPs are actually, you know, um, by, by taking that away from them, um, it is possible to offer to underprivileged uh, 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 subscribers at a much lower rate, uh, and that creates a, it, both of it, which is kind of like, if you know what, what MVNO means, it's uh, the, the mobile virtual network operator model, both of which kind of has that concept in it, but this might be a, a way to think about if there is basic connectivity, you know, how we better utilize that connectivity, and then back to the middle model question is, why isn't this, <laughs> why isn't this already a priority, and you know, what, what can we do? So I'll take that question. Uh, on the first part, um, 
I completely agree because governments like Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Korea, uh, government really did the initial investment in the first mile, middle mile, and even the last mile. So that when private enterprise came to the party, the, the, the heavy lifting was already done. So yes, to, to a big extent, government has to be involved. And in a country like the Philippines, for instance, uh, they've just had so many other priorities like physical infrastructure priorities like roads, bridges, and whatnot. But uh, over the last 10 years, they've realized that ICT is actually a, a, a game changer. So they've re recently uh, formed the Department of ICT, which has its own minister, its own secretary to run things. But as far as uh, why are they not investing, I think the bottom line is you're talking about billions and billions of US dollars that has to go into this investment in order for us to reach that uh, market that is underserved or unserved. And, and that's where government has to come in because public transportation is an investment that government makes initially and do the heavy lifting. So I think I completely agree that uh, you know, government has to participate in, in this type of investment. Um, I have one question for all the panelists. Um, you, just to, to add a couple thoughts to what you're saying. Another, the government's actually deliberately um, sometimes creating monopolies in middle mile and in, un, and in undersea cable landing stations. Um, that's, we've liberalized a lot of different parts of the network, but sometimes they create monopoly structures and reinforce them. And uh, that is a problem. Uh, and that's something where I think uh, certainly international policy can probably be helpful. Um, opening existing, uh, there's an interesting question about opening networks. Opening existing networks is actually something that there's a long history of. If it's a new network, the question is, is can that work? And actually there's a bunch of experiments going on now with new infrastructure and with that as a wholesale only model. Um, it's not clear how those are going to do because of the necessary risk you put in. But I want to start, go back to the last thing you said. The tie, if you want to know why it's not a priority, it's the lack of a tie to the SDGs. Uh, we have a blind spot. Connectivity is valuable to us in our own sake. It's just the nature of the community. Um, what we're discovering is health ministers, they want to know how it determines, to, to, it goes to their PKIs. And if you're going to build a coalition of support in the government, you're going to have to do that with the kind of combined services which we've traditionally ignored because we think of the separation of the service and the network. And to me, the analog is what's going on now with the small cell deployment of the 5G. There's not enough consumer bandwidth there. So they're actually looking at combining with other verticals to find additional combinations of, of, of support. And that is a new model that we, it's a hybrid type model that's not just focused on connectivity, which I think has been underappreciated, but is maybe helpful in the ways that Paul and Philip and, uh, are talking about that to unlock the potential of the investment. I'm sorry, I'm muted. Uh, so one question, short question for all the panelists. Um, how do you make the decision on the cost of the internet service for consumers, especially when you're targeting the last mile connectivity? Uh, so I was wondering what kind of data is available out there for you to make that decision or what kind of, uh, or how do you make that decision? And how much of it base, is based on the local communities, like the knowledge about the local communities and how much is intuition? Thank you. Actually for us, um, it's basically the benchmark has been what are the city folks paying? The rural folks don't want to pay anything more than that. The reality is it costs much more higher to deploy the network in the rural areas than in the city because of the, um, uh, it gets shared per capita across a much larger density of population, whereas in the rural areas, that's, that's not the case. So, but uh, the benchmark always has been what is the cost of internet in the city? And uh, I think that, that puts a ceiling to us in terms of what can get charged. And then we just go with that. Okay, uh, from, from my perspective, uh, it, it has to be, we've got to look at affordability and it's really what people can afford. And when you get to the rural areas, that affordability goes down very low. Uh, you could, people have a choice, do I buy bread, do I buy milk, or do I buy internet? They have very little disposable income. 
The Broadband Commission uh, took the A4I uh, affordability, which is uh, one gigabyte for 2% of GNI. And we've got countries in Africa that have met that, like Nigeria, but 40% of the population fall below that because of the income disparities. So it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, my personal view is we need to get to a point where we provide uh, a basic service of internet for free. Um, and I, th I think without that, and that will create the demand, and we'll get to what the gentleman says there. You know, once people get the demand, they start to realize it uh, enhances their life and income, and then they will pay for more. So, yeah, that, 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 that's basically my views. Thank you. So in our case, uh, since we've actually rolled out different models, uh, paid version, free version, so to answer the question is, I think as far as the audience we're addressing, it's definitely zero cost to them. It's free. I think that's how I look at it. So we've tried the paid version. People just weren't willing to pay consistently for us to be able to uh, afford covering our costs, right? So the revenue has to come from elsewhere. And that's why we're working with corporate partners to uh, generate business for them using our connectivity to um, bring them business, but also give the public access to the internet at the same time. I will uh, go back to repeat, so please. Yeah. Okay, uh, just a quick thing. There's a process that's different for each neighborhood. But you comment about businesses paying for it. There is precedent in intercity roads. Before the automobile made people appreciate roads, the businesses in a community would invest with not looking for profit in the roads themselves because it benefited them in commerce. So the idea of having business demonstrate the value is not that you're gonna, they're going to pay you for the routers. They're basically rent, you know, building common infrastructure and they benefit from it. So I think that's one way of driving the value. But after that, I think... The key, we have to get to the point where people see the value, and I think that's, you know, any way we do that. And I, given the commitment, I'm delighted to give them a chance to speak. The question is, the middle mile challenge is a real one here in Nigeria as well. One consideration is, can we start to apply the heavily unused universal service funds in more creative ways to get that middle mile connectivity to community networks and other innovative low cost networks. So is there, I would love to get the thoughts of the people who are doing this on the ground. Should we be encouraging universal service funding to be applied not just to last mile connectivity but to middle mile connectivity? Okay, uh, I, I, I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, the middle mile, without the middle mile, we, we don't have last mile <laughs> at the end of the day. We are almost at time, we're at time so I'll look quickly. Yes. Um, I'm from the Argentine regulator. We, some months ago, we um, bring a new license for community networks for free. And we are starting to just that, to give them money from the Universal Service Fund to create their infrastructure to get to only with cities below 5,000 people and with no e ESP uh, bringing service there. So we think it's a, it's a good method to, to get there to, and connect the small towns. an inspirational model to understand where to put those limited resources to the most effect. And I think that finding uh, business models that are creative, scalable, and sustainable so that it's not ongoing support, but hopefully one-time investments that get uh, deployments jump-started, I think is exactly the right approach. Well, at this point, we've reached the end of our appointed hour. I wanted to thank all of you for coming because this is the knowledge, the goal of this was to draw on the knowledge in the room. We've succeeded in doing that. I wanted to thank uh, the panelists for creating uh, such a great, robust discussion. Antonio from Latin America, uh, from Nepal, Philip from the Southeast Asia, and from Africa. I think we're very well represented here across the globe. 
and I'm particularly grateful to our colleagues from the Philippines and Nepal for accepting our invitation to come here. They actually traveled just to participate in this panel as the primary thing, and they've traveled a great deal to participate in the IGF. And to give, we are committed in our program to give a platform to the people who are actually building the networks. So not just the so-called experts, but to find out from the people directly what the real and I wanted to personally thank you for the terrific work all three of you are doing in actually making all the things that policymakers talk about in general terms a reality. And with that, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>